Okay, is this on? I think it is, good. Um, hello everybody and welcome to our session on embracing the trade-off. I'm Greg Nietzsche from Kenny Arth. Um, my boss, Diane, will tell you a lot more about Kenny Arth, so I will not steal her thunder. But um, I do want to thank you all for coming to this very subversive session. I realized that I came into this room this morning and there were chairs way back to the end there, was, you know, packed in deep. And I thought, wow, that's great. We got a big room. A lot of people may show up for this thing about concessionary or impact first or catalytic capital. But, um, but they, they clearly took away the chairs in an effort to try to uh, ban our very controversial ideas. <laughs> because um, as you all know, this is a scary concept in the industry today that there might be trade-offs, right? We are supposed to do well by doing good, right? It's not that attractive to do kind of okay, but do good, right? So um, today we have um, really a great panel of four investors who are focused on um, this, this part of the market that really needs capital um, at, at lower costs and it needs capital to reach very deeply underserved communities and um, our investors who recognize the reality that you are not going to get rich by serving the poorest communities and are unafraid in many ways to pardon my language to say that is just bullshit and we as an industry need to think harder about how we're going to address those those kinds of communities so um, I, i'm really excited for this panel i was you know when we submitted the panel we didn't think it would get accepted. We, you know, we felt like, oh, you know, the sort of mainstream messaging has moved on from this. But um, really, really excited to to have this on and to to um, to have y'all to have y'all join us. So um, I do want to keep this kind of lively. So um, you know, every moderator says that and then proceeds to like moderate the most boring thing ever. So you know, this this will, tr you know, if you have a question, raise your hand. If you have a comment, make sure it's just short and good, um, and, um, and we'll, we'll go from there. So um, I thought out of uh, job security, I would start with my boss. Um, but <laughs> uh, so I, I for, first sort of start the panel um, with, with Diane Eisenberg, the founder of Kenny Arth. And Diane, if you can... Um, you know, give us some background on Kenny Arth and, and really talk a little bit about what Impact First has, has come to mean to us. Thanks, Greg. Um, Kenny Arth is a single family office that I founded six years ago um, to basically um, use the assets of my family. Um, we are both a private family foundation and we also have unrestricted assets and we run that out of one office. Um, I think that we're probably better known for some of the writing that we've done, but I'm beginning to realize people don't know the size that we are, so we manage about $500 million. Um, we have a, a focus on rural livelihoods and underserved communities, um, primarily um, in, but not exclusively in Sub-Saharan Africa, but we work um, globally. Um, our directs are primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa, and um, we basically have started working in the United States as well in the five persistent poverty areas, as we have actually seen a lot of parallels um, between those communities uh, in the US and in emerging markets, um, sadly. Um, one of the things that we came to realize fairly early on is that there's a failure of um, the markets in, in these kind of communities. So market rate capital just isn't going to flow there because it, it doesn't work. And because of the emphasis, I think, on, on double bottom returns, um, it's actually irrational that, that money isn't going there because there has been, um, you know, put forward the belief that these solutions 
you know, we'll be able to market rate returns or double bottom returns will, will work um, to solve problems throughout um, the world, including with some of the poorest people in the world. And it, it's clear that that isn't going to happen. And if those of us who really want to start getting capital flowing in that direction, we have to look at um, what kind of capital does work. So, you know, after a, a couple of years when we came to that conclusion, we, we realized that um, we really needed to become impact first, um, look at the impact that we wanted to, and then put return second. And so we sort of played around with that and decided that the most what what fit well with our strategy was to have something which I know it's you know people use the phrase all the time capital preservation. So we use we have capital preservation um, throughout our investment. So we use it with both the foundation endowment and also with the unrestricted assets and. The way that we look at it with the endowment, because I think with foundations, um, people would assume then if we have a capital preservation strategy, then automatically we're going to be having a shrinking endowment because you know you have to have a, a five percent um, every year that that you spend. But we also, alongside that, use our distributions. Um, we through we have. Um, program related investments. So because of that and the kind of investing we tend to do, so we tend to primarily do, do debt investing um, and that really is because there's a real demand for working capital in, in the kind of markets that, that we're working in. We tend to um, see most of that money recaptured with the foundation. So we almost have um, this sort of uh, rolling fund that, that we are able to redistrib redistribute. So even if our endowment, and it's really uncertain what's gonna happen with the endowment because we with capital preservation, basically it's costs and inflation. So I'm, it's unclear whether it's going to marginally shrink over time, but the, the point is that we're able to actually put far more money to work than we would have otherwise. And with our capital preservation investing um, with the endowment um, over time, because we're in the process of sort of trans moving that money towards full 100% um, capital preservation, um, we will then have 100% of our money working towards um, capital preservation. Right. Um, and I, I'll just add one thing in terms of um, just specific numbers in terms of what we look for on, on return. When Diane's saying capital preservation, we kind of mean that in real dollar terms. Um, you know, we're try we are trying to generate some return. We generate basically inflation plus expenses over time. So, um, you know, we, 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 we look for a modest two to 3% return on the portfolio at large so that we can continue to, to, to do this work. But, um, I, you know, people always are talking in specific numbers about returns. So that, you know, that, that's, you know, in reality, that is what we, you know, are looking for on, on a, on sort of an aggregate returns base. Doesn't mean that, you know, we don't turn down returns. If someone comes, if we're working in a community and the right contextual return is higher, we're not going to be suckers and say, hey, we'll just take lower because we're just good people. Um, but, uh, but anyway, that's, that's kind of numerical. So I'll come back to Diane and talk a little bit more about specifically what we look for in deals. But um, we'll sort of turn to Lynn, um, who's become a close partner of ours on, on many deals. Lynn's the head of lending um, for the Candide Group um, and the managing director of a new fund that, um, that Candide's launched called Almina. Um, so, but it would be great, Lynn, if you give a little bit of background on the work Candide does and, and what this concept has come to mean to you of Impact First. Sure, great. Hi, everyone. Um, so Candide Group is a registered investment advisor based here in the Bay Area, and we are advising high net worth individuals on how they want to manage their money. And we're very fortunate that we work with um, some families who are incredibly socially progressive and understand that to move towards transformative change and accountability, then we really have to look at the resources that we're putting in and also what an appropriate return is in these communities. So we manage 65 investments right now. I want to say it's about $50 million. And that's domestic and international 
across a broad range of different industries. And we're really, really focused on social justice. And part of this strategy when we decided to launch the Olamina Fund was we had recognized that particularly domestically in the US, there's a lot of um, organizations that are working in community and they can't get access to capital because of historic barriers and systemic exclusion. So I read a statistic recently that a foundation per individual in New York will fund $4,000 and in Alabama that number is 44. And if you're looking at community development financial institutions that are really building out the ecosystem in some of these communities, um, the big banks aren't in Alabama or Mississippi or Indian country. In fact, in Indian country, they've been completely excluded because they're sovereign nations. So the capital really isn't flowing there. So what we did with Olamina is we decided to make really key priorities that we would invest in these specific geographic areas and in these institutions because we believe that community, the community knows the resources it needs and when they're given those resources, they can thrive. We did not center the investor as part of designing Olamina. We centered the community and what it needed and the rate of return, you know, some people would say it's not a market rate of return, but my question would be, well, what is a rate of return when you're talking about in investing in social and racial justice? So Candide has really been at the forefront of thinking through what return means differently in that lens of social justice and sustainability. And we're really grateful to have partners like Kenny Arth who are also thinking that through. Um, the Olamina Fund's about $40 million, so it's not an insignificant amount of capital, and we're hoping to raise up to 100 over the next three to five years. But it was very intentional. We want people to buy into the values of the fund and not necessarily the return, because if we're going to talk about restoration and repair, then we have to center all stakeholders and not just the investor. Great. Yeah, super, super helpful background. And we'll, we'll come back again to very specific examples of deals that, that, um, that would fit the fund's mandate. So, um, Rick, I want to turn to you. Um, CEO of Global Partnerships, been a manager that we've at, at Kenny Arth invested in. Um, I mean, this as an aside, this is actually the easiest panel I've ever moderated since I don't think I've ever moderated a panel where everyone's either a real partner, we've done deals, or a manager we've invested in. So um, it made the prep really easy because we're all chatting anyway um, all the time. But, um, but, but Rick, if you can tell us a little bit about the history of Global Partnerships. Um, and, uh, and, and you know, what impact first has come to mean to you on, on your journey as a nonprofit social investor? Sure. Um, so Global Partnership started just over 25 years ago, actually as a family foundation uh, doing grant making in the early days of microcredit. And in 2005, uh, we pivoted, we realized uh, that while philanthropy has an important role to play, we would never uh, achieve impact at scale by staying with a philanthropic model. So we pivoted and uh, became a fund manager for the first time in 2005. <clears throat> so we're currently a, an impact first fund manager uh, whose mission is to expand opportunity for people living in poverty. We're managing about 180 million for active funds. The bulk of that are debt funds, but we also have a $5 million social venture fund making uh, seed and early stage in, uh, investments in startup social enterprises. Um, we're investing in uh, all in sustainable solutions to poverty throughout Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America and the, and the Caribbean. Um, and I think uh, as a working definition, what we mean by impact first has been captured by the uh, those others on the stage. Um, so we're, we're talking about maximum social impact subject to seeking capital preservation with a modest return to offset inflation. So that, that tends to fall in line with uh, the kinds of return expectations that, that Greg mentioned. Um, so when we think about impact, uh, we think about it on four dimensions. Um, the first is broadening opportunity. So our understanding of poverty is that it is in part a economic challenge, but it is in equal measure um, a, a challenge around access to other things. And so we invest, we value and invest in not just livelihoods, but in education and energy and health and housing and sanitation, kind of across all the different facets of poverty. Uh, the second for us is deepening inclusion. So our, we tend to invest at the edge of the market where 
uh, too many people are left behind. So all of our investing is aimed at including people living under $5.50 a day. Most of it is inclusive of people living under $3.20 a day, with a particular concern for impoverished women and the rural poor who are dis disproportionately excluded from virtually every form of opportunity. Uh, the third is um, serving millions, so we value impact at scale. And, um, and we're trying to invest in ways that uh, not, don't just serve thousands or hundreds of thousands, but millions of people. Uh, last year, our investments, uh, just attributable to our capital, created opportunity for 4.8 million people. And the last is improving lives. At the end of the day, that's what it's all about, of course, and, and it's uh, clearly the hardest to measure. Um, but we're only investing where evidence and direct experience suggest to us that the products and services that are being delivered to uh, people living in poverty will empower them both economically or to otherwise to have concrete, tangible improvements in their lives. So uh, we think about impact on those four dimensions while seeking to preserve capital on an inflation-adjusted basis. Um, and I think the, the reason... In a nutshell, the reason that we've chosen to be impact first is because we think it performs better on our mission. We think we can actually have higher impact, expanding opportunity for people living in poverty as an impact first investor rather than as a return first investor. And, that, and the reasons for that really boil down to two. Um, one, I would say, are what I would describe as the real economics of inclusion. Uh, in our experience, it is uh, sometimes sustainable and rarely highly profitable to serve poorer and more marginalized populations. And the role of uh, return first capital, they, it either tends to ignore those populations altogether or it introduces uh, economic incentives that tend to push social enterprises up market. So to move away from the more vulnerable people and, uh, and seek to uh, serve populations where it's, it's easier to make money. And we don't have a, a, a ideological or, or a philosophical um, uh, debate with that. Uh, that's the, that capital is doing what it's doing, but it isn't doing what we care about. And uh, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the first reason. The second reason um, is the impact of capital on product market strategies. So in many cases, what we find is that um, it takes a combination of products and services to have real impact. So for example, with smallholder farmers, there are 500 million smallholder farmers in the world, most of them growing subsistence crops. Um, in our experience, there are, however it gets delivered, there are three things that are needed to help smallholder farmers. One is the access to the right kinds of inputs, the seeds and fertilizer, and um, the second is some form of technical assistance on what to plant, when to plant, how to plant, how to use inputs so that crop quality and yields go up. And the third is, uh, to the extent that families are using those crops not for family food security, but for income generation, then they need uh, reliable access to markets. And what we find is that, um, by way of example, that re return first investing tends to focus on those things where, where there's pro uh, positive margin, which tends to be the input sale. And they tend to underinvest in the things, in this case, the technical assistance and the market access that are essential for helping smallholder farmers really make progress. So both are, as it relates to inclusion and ultimately as it relates to achieving higher impact, um, you know, we've, it's been our experience that Impact First delivers superior results, and, and that's why we do what we do. Great. Yeah, no, that <clears throat> very helpful. And this idea that you brought up about um, investing in impact where the evidence exists and we sort of follow through follow that to, to, to sort of the end um, is something we'll, we'll come back to in thinking about how we all look for evidence and and how we measure uh, measure that impact over time but um, last but certainly not least we'll bring in Richard Greenberg into the into the conversation um, Richard is is with OPIC soon to be renamed the US Development Finance Corporation um, any day or maybe any month now. Um, and, um, you know, I think there's, there's maybe no institution right now that is doing more for this sector of impact first investing than, than OPIC's doing at major scale. Um, I think that a, a lot of private investors, even those of us who have significant capital, um, you know, we can't come even close to the, the kind of check sizes that that, that Richard and the team at OPIC are capable of writing. So, um, you know, they've been a really valued partner of, of, of ours. And, um, 
and I think are, are doing a ton for the industry. So Richard, if you could talk a little bit about kind of, you know, what OPIC does in this space generally for those who might not be familiar with the organization, um, and then how you're thinking about this idea of impact first internally and sort of pushing your own thinking internally about how to get even more impact out of every dollar. Thank you very much, Craig. I uh, appreciate those comments uh, about OPIC and really our success. If we have success, it's through Kenny Arth, Global Partnerships, maybe Ken T, at some point, uh, the partners that we, we have. But OPIC is the U.S. Government Development Finance Institution. As Greg mentioned, um, uh, we are transforming ourselves into what will be called the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. We're going to call it DFC for short. Um, it was scheduled to launch actually in October 1 uh, based on legislation that was passed by Congress a year prior. But um, we have to wait for Congress to pass a budget for fiscal 20 to formally launch. Uh, so I can say a little bit more about that in, in a bit. But um, uh, we, OPIC, and going forward as a DFC, are charged with being a, a self-sustaining organization. That's actually, it was in the OPIC uh, charter. It's not phrased that way in, in, in the DFC charter. Uh, or legislation, but uh, our mindset is to be a self-sustaining organization. And like any any uh, uh, other DFI or the, the groups here, I mean, we're we're an impact investor. That's why we exist: is to generate development. And and turning a profit is not is not essential or, or a requirement. Uh, having said that, OPIC, I think prides itself, if you will, on having a track record over decades of always generating some some profit, which we return to the Treasury, so any of you who are U.S. citizens, uh, there are no taxpayer dollars involved that need to subsidize the, the organization, which I think is, is important. Um, so we are self-sustaining and, and an in impact investor. Um, I think uh, going forward, uh, the direction is, is to, as Greg was alluding to, is to sort of enrich and enhance and, and develop further our model so that we can address the uh, the uh, generate the impact that we all want want to see, and we're doing that in, in a number of ways. Um, in my team, which is the social enterprise finance team, we've tried to be innovative in developing products and tools, and really the relationships that we build with the great social investors here um, to understand how we can provide capital that's additional. So, for example, um, we've been working with global partnerships uh, in, a, in a fund recently that is really going to drive impact where we were an anchor investor and Kenny Arth is a contributor as well. And with our contribution, I think we were help enable to catalyze some of the other capital that's coming in for an impact first uh, uh, product. Now, we don't just jump into these things lightly because we do have to use our, our government-backed capital uh, very prudently, of course. Um, and the credit goes to Rick and his team at Global Partnerships for um, building a relationship with us over a number of years. We've placed capital in a whole series of funds, gotten to know, know them very well, um, have a great appreciation for their impact model and how robust and detailed it is so that we know that when we're investing in a, in a product that, or in a, in a business or a fund that really is an impact first, probably has blended capital involved, different kinds of return requirements, that it really is going to deliver that impact. I mean, on the other side of the house, we're working on a lot of large infrastructure deals globally. We have lots of agendas and lots of stakeholders that we need to serve, and those deals are, you know, market return uh, deals. And, and, and we always, in any case, want to start with a market return framework for ourselves, but then not be averse to investing in companies. We do direct placements, funds, all kinds of intermediaries that are going to really drive the impact. And one last thing I'll mention is that um, as part of the uh, transition to the new DFC, we've built out a new impact framework for ourselves. We always have had a model to assess each deal for what the impact will be, but we've, we've made it much more robust and sophisticated. We call it the impact quotient. And it, it just, I'll just mention briefly, has sort of three pillars at the highest level for um, understanding what, as we intake projects, uh, how we might uh, look at the categories of impact that are going to be generated. One is growth, one economic growth, one is innovation, and one is inclusion. And then under those uh, categories, of course, there's a whole series of subpoints to help us um, assess the impact and then create a score which we can use to benchmark. 
So let me stop there yeah. and happy to Great. engage further on no, the, that, all those that's, topics. That's super helpful. And I think that impact framework is, is something we can, we can also come back to. One, one um, point about the fund that you mentioned that I think is worth also clarifying in detail is, you know, so this is a new global partnerships fund where um, Kenny Arth and um, W.K. Kellogg have put in combined about $5 million in, in junior money, which has unlocked $50 million from OPEC. So leverage is something we care a lot about in our deals. And, you know, getting 10 to 1 leverage is just extraordinary for private investors looking to um, looking to scale these kinds of vehicles. If I may, Greg, let me just say, that's not typical for what we've done. <laughs> and we're going to do three um, more of these together, Richard. And I see some next. other fund managers out there that we work with that are probably taking notes right now. We haven't <laughs> given, but I, as I said, I wanted to note that that's, it's a unique situation. It's a reflection of what Global Partnerships is able to bring and deliver alongside the other partners to that yeah, transaction. Right. So I'm going to have um, each, of, um, each of the folks talk about some very specific examples of what an impact first deal looks like so that f everyone gets a sense of, of, of some of those deals and what we, what, what we look for in those deals. Um, but before I do that, does anyone, are there any background questions having heard these sort of introductions around impact first that are burning on people's mind that somebody's thinking, I still don't get it. What's the difference between impact first and finance first or y'all are crazy that you're not just making loads of money. Um, any any uh, questions? We, oh, yep. discussion I had yesterday was uh, wonderful, well-meaning individuals in the impact investment spaces. I asked them a question, a very basic question. What, what kind of return are you looking for? Oh, market rate return. And then why do you call it impact investment? If you're looking for market rate return, right. yeah. well, and I'm not kidding you, the market rate return he asked, he said to me yeah. was 10 percent, and I'm right. like, are you kidding? Right. Sorry, yeah. but so, but Diane <laughs> said, <laughs> Diane, I am from Africa too, so Diane said uh, something to the 3 percent, or you just do it because you believe in what you're doing. I really would like you to clarify that notion of impact investment. What are we talking about when we talk about impact investment? If you're looking for a market rate. Uh, investment re yep. return on your investment. Why are you calling it impact investment? Thank yep. you. Yeah. Well, I sort of think you answered your own question. <laughs> um, I am in complete. Uh, I concur with you. So I sort of feel like if market rate money works, then sometimes I think people might have particular sectorial preferences or particular. I think climate change. You could have a fantastic climate change portfolio that can be profit making. So if that's your area of interest and you are looking for impact, you can do that in a market way. way. And I think people, if they were more intentional with market rate investing, that would be fantastic and they could maximize their impact. I view impact investing as when market rate capital doesn't work. And I think we've discussed some of the kind of blends of capital that can not only leverage, but actually is the capital that is able to serve that market best. And I think that what Rick was saying about market rate capital, when you introduce it into these markets, it doesn't work. So if you have enterprises there, they just go um, towards the lower hanging fruit. So we've seen a lot of failures with that. And um, I think that also the technical assistance that was um, that Rick mentioned with agriculture, you have this with a whole bunch of, it's, it's not just with agriculture, but it's, it's with create job creation and infrastructure in these most areas that really require far more than ju you know, just capital. It's, it's a much more complicated issue um, that, that we're looking at. So I do think that people need to be realistic about what they're trying to achieve with their capital. Yeah. So I, I mean, for us, it really isn't, um, even though Greg said, you know, it's two to three percent, it's really what is the capital that's needed. So, you know, we, we often will use capital in a way that it isn't just the return, it's where your capital is sitting. So we will often be subordinate as, as, as um, we've done, done with OPIC. Um, we often will have long-term like quasi-equity capital that's sitting there because that capital is required to unleash other capital. So it's way more than just what your return yeah, and maybe, is. Maybe in, to sort of get into one of those examples of, of sort of quasi-secondary capital, do you, you want to talk a little bit about maybe hope or 
Um, um, or cr sure, okay. yeah, no, I mean, there's a we, there's a bunch of different. <laughs> go, go ahead. Um, for sort of, uh, because this is a, an example, actually, it's, it's an Africa fund, and it's um, cross boundary energy mini grid fund. So basically, we have put in the patient junior equity tranche. So we put in. Um, well, that tranche is a, a million and a half, and that released from Rockefeller, five million, which is the subordinate debt, which then released, I think it's, it's 10 million, something, yeah. something called REP or REAP, which is a UK fund that's an energy um, fund. So they were able to, I mean, that mini grid, like um, actually funding mini grids is really challenging because of the awkward payback period when we're talking about debt. So this is really um, like the, the first pilot fund to, to do this. Um, so I, I think that's, that's a really good example of us playing that sort of patient capital and the, the higher risk capital to unlock other capital. Yeah, great. So I, I think this, this blended idea of unlocking big pools of capital, I think that's a great example of impact first. I think another way to think about impact versus how are we bringing costs of capital generally down so that customers ultimately experience lower costs. Um, Lynn, if you could talk a little bit about um, a deal we recently did together in the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund and maybe how that's directly translating low cost into low cost for customers. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. So um, New Hampshire Community Loan Fund, funnily enough, is based in New Hampshire. Um, do, I don't know if there's any fans of John Oliver in here, but New Hampshire Community Loan Fund does a lot with uh, mobile uh, manufactured housing, mobile home parks. And if anybody saw the John Oliver series um, episode where they're talking about how private equity is coming into these communities because people who are in mobile homes, it's, they're basically just cash cows for these private equity investments. New Hampshire Community Loan Fund goes into these communities when they're looking to purchase their residences and sets up a cooperative structure in order that the people who are living in there actually have self-determination. So they came to uh, Candide and to Kenny Arth to help do some uh, financing for four major projects that were being sought after by private equity. And what happens when private equity goes in is they pay a price and then they put up the rents and put up the services and, and all of these things. And the residents have nowhere else to go, so they just have to figure out how to pay for it. And with our lower cost of capital that we could provide to them, it meant that those cooperatives were, it was only minimal rental increases, if any rental increases at all, for those communities who are already there. Because these are populations that are forgotten and these are populations that are not generating the levels of income that we've seen in the Bay Area or New York or any of these major cities over the last 10 years. But one really amazing thing we did as part of this, um, as part of this relationship building was we actually ended up lowering our interest rate and then increasing the amount of capital we were going to provide to them so that they could then take out higher cost of capital, which then brought down their overall blended cost of capital across the organization and has since led them to have the confidence to reduce the interest rates they're paying on their notes to their investors. So it flows through in many different areas when you can step up and say, actually, I see you. I see what you're trying to do in this community. You are building community wealth amongst these stakeholders, and we want to help and support you through that. And we can do this in many different ways. And we actually offered them three alternatives as to what we could do and let them make the decision. So it wasn't us telling them, like, you should do this and this. It's like, here's three things we think you could do. Which option would you like to discuss? Um, so that was an, a really, really interesting way of thinking through what it means, A, to be in relationship, what it means for return and what it means to really help um, the people on the ground who are living this everyday reality that is so different from the reality so many of us live. Yeah, great. Um, so, uh, Rick, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask you I, either for, for a specific example of a deal, if, if you want, or, or it's a multiple choice question, you can choose which one to play. Um, you know, or to talk a little bit generally about the kinds of deals you were seeing with your previous funds with a higher cost of capital that you couldn't do, yeah. that you thought, boy, if one day we had this thing, this future impact first development fund with a lower cost of capital, boy, we, that's a deal we, we 
would have done, we would have liked to have done, and now we can do. Yeah. Um, well, so maybe I'll riff a little bit on right. your on your second. Uh, although I would say that um, uh, we've we're deploying an impact first strategy across all of our funds, right. and so. What was unique about the Impact First Development Fund is, is that it dropped the cost of capital by another 175 right. basis points. Um, so I, I think we see several different types of uh, investments where the cost of the capital or the nature of the capital um, allows for higher impact. So the first is, like, uh, one would be the smallholder farmer inputs example that I gave previously. If you lend a million dollars at 5% rather than 10%, and then the enterprise has $50,000 a year, to, to fund extension workers or technical assistance to smallholder farmers. Um, you just took something that where they're, the farmers were just gonna get inputs to where they're gonna get inputs from and technical assistance, and that makes all the difference in terms of crop quality and yield. So that's where just a, a change in the interest rate, uh, when you run it through the operating economics of the social enterprise, leads to higher impact. An, another category uh, that we do a lot of uh, are in what I would call blended models where sometimes this is microfinance institutions that serve a range of different clients. And from our perspective, we want them to, to, be, to be serving, for example, in our women centered finance with education work, uh, poorer women and coupling credit with access to savings and education, which makes the enterprises more successful. So we size our investment. We, we, lo we lower the interest rate and we size the investment that we make in a given, in this case, microfinance institution, based on how many people living under $5.50 a day and how many people living under $3.20 a day. So we're aligning the lower cost capital with their depth of penetration at the low end of, of the market. And, and we don't, and, and I think there are likely to be what I would describe as hybrid social enterprises with multiple types of capital involved. That's just the nature of, uh, of things. Mm -hmm. But I think we would expect to, uh, we've been doing some of that and I think we would expect to do more of that with more degrees of freedom to lower the cost of capital in this, in this new fund. Correct. And, and Richard, finally, um, any, any uh, sort of pet, pet project, <laughs> sort of favorite example of, there are a lot of examples, yeah. and we're doing a, a lot of direct placements, um, but uh, also looking, of course, to the intermediaries where we can place capital, but we feel it's important to, to really get our hands into, uh, you know, still a lot of direct placements, and we launched a program about five years ago we call Portfolio for Impact to stretch ourselves into the more earlier stage companies looking for, say, one to five million dollars that were already invested in by great investors, social investors, mission aligned, that needed that next stage of debt capital to scale up. But it's not just about, you know, taking the same product and applying it because that, now you're in a different kind of space. And so we've had to, you know, see how we could innovate and place capital in the right way, in the right place. And it's not just about the pricing, obviously, it's about the tenor, the structure, self-liquidating structures uh, that are still, you know, debt-oriented so that we could do that, but nevertheless address what type of capital is really needed. And we've learned some lessons the hard way as well um, in, in that regard in terms of uh, not, not being in that position and companies taking on that type of capital at the, at the wrong time and, or in the wrong amount. So that's really been important for us. And then going forward under the DFC, we're going to have equity for the first time, which will place us on a finally on a level playing field, if you will, with all of our fellow DFIs, as well as technical assistance. Now, you know, there's going to be a, 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 a sort of a slow ramp up to how we can place that equity, but we intend to use it for funds that, that, that need that type of capital and in, in impact first oriented, as well as selectively direct placements where, where we, we can play a, a, an added role and help to catalyze other capital. So the pricing is, is, is one aspect of it, but um, you know, we, we are uh, uh, you know, trying to, we, we have to be very sensitive not to be competing with the private sector. And maybe one, one last thing I'll say is under the uh, small window for the portfolio for impact, sometimes we get pulled in different directions with respect to pricing. If there are foundations or groups like yours involved that you know, are looking to uh, contribute at, a, at a, you know, a, relative, a lower price so that that benefit can be passed on, uh, then if we want to participate, we need to price at that level, essentially, to, to match foundations and so on. On the other hand, if there aren't those types of investors, we see deals where there are 
uh, let's call them impact-oriented investors, but are still looking to price more competitively, let's say. Mm -hmm. And then if we want to participate, we can't undercut the pricing of those other investors, so we get pulled actually in a higher direction. So mm -hmm. it's been an interesting place when people ask about how we're pricing for these kinds of deals. Sometimes it's lower than we've done, other times it's higher, but that's okay for us in the context of a, a portfolio of 26 billion that we have right now. And these are, you know, tend to be relatively smaller deals that, that are really mission driven for us. Yeah, so I actually want to follow that, that thread around the interplay or the interaction or intersection between whether it's finance first impact investors and um, kind of impact first First impact, God, the, we were just so lost. Impact first, impact impact. God, there's so much lingo. It's, anyway, um, but I, you know the the these sort of the tensions that I think can come up in in, in these deals. So I'm I'm curious if anyone um, would want to jump in on a on an example where you know we've saw return first capital come into a market that maybe those of us had been investing in and, and sort of change the dynamics. Not, not, and I'm not talking conventional, I'm not talking the hedge fund example of, of, of mobile home parks, I'm talking is there an example of return first impact investors interacting with us in a difficult way or a way that transforms what enterprises in that market um, might, might, might be doing? Well, uh, one uh, historical example is the commercialization of microfinance. Mm -hmm. And so what, uh, what we observed was a divergence, um, an emphasis in more commercially focused uh, return first enterprises on, uh, on the highly profitable products and lending, uh, particularly if you're um, less uh, concerned with consumer protection and, if, and as long as you don't spend any of your margin on things like education, which tend to depress margins, that we saw dynamics in the microfinance industry, which it made it entirely about the loans, sometimes harmful, and, and in many cases less impactful, even if it wasn't harmful, than it would be otherwise, because of the economic incentives that went with uh, return first capital. Mm -hmm. uh, w as we watched that unfold, you know, the players that were more client-centric, which were out in front in terms of consumer protection, uh, and which tended to combine access to credit with savings, because the two of them is more powerful, uh, but really with education, so pr providing financial literacy, business education, as well as leveraging the last mile economics to also bring things like family nutrition and health education. Those were margin depressing things which were squeezed out uh, of the more return, the more purely commercial um, uh, dynamics, but which remained in the more client-centered and, and impact first. Yep. I'd also say, um, just from all the research I've done, the community development financial institutions here in the U.S., I mean, they were came out of the civil rights movement and redlining and all of these incredibly racial, um, restricted racial covenants and really racist practices within the financial system. And originally when the CDFI started, they were funded by faith-based organizations and individuals. And then um, the CDFI fund was created to unleash all of this capital from the government and force the banks to invest in these institutions. And what it did was it moved these organizations away from their social justice roots because the banks are like, well, we'll give you this money, but we want you to underwrite like how we underwrite. We don't want the risk on our balance sheet. We'll give you the money to do that, but we want to make sure that we're getting an appropriate rate of return and making sure that we're getting our money back. And where we find um, that it's where we find community development financial institutions right now in America is the banks are actually offering less favorable terms and they're taking away their most concessionary capital, like their EQ2s. So what we're talking about doing is linking back with what if donor advised funds, for example, could provide a new source of capital that is impact first to really change the dynamics of these organizations away from how the banks are forcing them essentially to be in right relationship with community. Um, I have an example, um, the energy access. Um, one of, so this is solar home systems, I'll use solar home systems in East Africa as, an, as, as the particular example. So around five years ago, that was actually our first entree into 
um, impact investing, and um, there was huge amounts of money that was flowing into equity with through um, Silicon Valley investors. They were seeing this, like, ultimately, I guess, as, as a tech play. Um, but I think um, I would say I, there was an element of naivete or not understanding the market, not understanding this ridiculous burn rate. So in, in essence, they were subsidizing this really rapid growth and you know the the burn was un, un like just unbelievable and money kept getting poured in but because of that the the model really wasn't a, a workable feasible model and eventually even those investors got tired and, and the tap got turned off and the people who paid the price of course were um, <laughs> people who were living in the most remote rural areas who had invested in, in solar home systems, and it was mispriced. We, we saw that because we were primarily debt investors, and at one point we probably had four different investments, um, including one in a fund, so we could see what was happening, and what and the default rates were, were um, totally unacceptable. So, you know, what we, the story that was being told really wasn't reflected in what we saw on the ground. And, and I personally felt the detriment that that had done to these communities because a lot of people did actually end up with a stranded a asset. And these are some of the poorest people on earth. So we're, so we're talking the most remote areas. So that's where they started. Um, you know, I think that solar homes system, the whole sector has changed. There's been, um, I think there's been a lot of, um, acquisitions at probably realistic valuations, everybody's calmed down, but also a, a result is that there's been a real focus on peri-urban and, and, and urban communities. So, you know, the you could say the lower hanging fruit or what works in a market-based model. Mm. So we still have the problem of how are we going to get affordable energy to these most remote, poorest communities with lumpy incomes. And those are the sorts of things that you know, global partnerships work on, that, that we work on. Um, so I think that, that's an example of, yeah. of where there was a, certainly um, a clash or, or a problem for us with, with our impact um, dollars. Great. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how we're all measuring impact. But are, do we have any, any questions from, yeah, sure. Speak, I think we, we speak up because we don't have a mic. I have a question. So, as for organizations that work out right now, the Mission Economic Development Agency, where the affordable housing developer is the one that is going to be able to get the affordable housing developer and acquire and they have a CDFI arm, and we're trying to raise a blended cost of capital rate that's below everything that's in the market right now for our CDFI. And so, I talked to a lot of banks and foundations and institutions on a day to day basis while we raise our funds. But Right. So um, it's, a good, it's a good question, and I think it brings us to the collective whining part of the, in a good way, co our collective complaining part of the, of the uh, uh, you know, of, of the panel, which is that there's not much of this capital. I mean, I think that, you know, we all would want to see there be more. I'm curious if panel, if anyone has a response in terms of, you know, number one, why isn't there more? Um, and number two, where 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 should should people be looking for it? I'm happy to answer <laughs> that. I think, I mean, because as someone who um, we has both a, a foundation and we have unrestricted family assets, I feel like um, certainly from the the f foundation perspective, I think there there's a lot of somehow fear that people aren't fulfilling their f fiscal responsibility. Um, if they look at the kind of investing we do. And 
I feel like that there's no evidence of that. The, the use of PRIs, I pers I, first of all, I want to preface this to say that I think there are some incredible foundations that are doing very focused grant-making work, so I really don't want us all to start doing PRIs because I think that would be catastrophic. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I worry a little bit like the double bottom line impact investing that a lot of foundations are getting a bit like, oh, we should be doing PRIs. And people who have had really robust programs that are critical to certain communities, just like our money is critical. Certain grant funding is absolutely critical. If that gets cut back, that's going to be a really serious problem. But I also just feel when, I, you know, I want to, um, I suppose, call out what's happening um, with MacArthur and their um, C3 initiative, um, which is something that is really focusing on the kind of capital that we're looking at. They're going to be doing similar things to what we've done with, with OPIC and with global partnerships, and I think they're, they're really trying to get people to see the, how critical the kind of capital that we have is, and when you have a large foundation like that leading it, I hope it will sort of encourage other foundations to start looking at how they can use their money more catalytically and more effectively and leverage mo money in another way, and I think a lot of it also has to do with boards being quite conservative um, and, and the friction there. Um, with high net wealth, individuals, I, I find that a challenging question for me because I can't see what else we possibly could do if, if we have the objective to move capital where we want to move it, which I've explained to you where that is. Um, I, I guess my plea would be to get if only some high net in wealth families and individuals would like just dip their toe in this and somehow get excited. I get really excited like the 10x leverage we have to me that's like a that's like a unicorn. Like I truly get excited. This makes me I you know I think this is amazing because we're able to unleash all this money. If people had that reaction towards impact that they had towards making money, I think it would be transformative. And since this is impact investing, you know, it would be kind of good if that's what we started measuring. You know, so you know, I just, my plea is some of you out there, just like give it a try and maybe that'll feel just as good as that 10X financial return that you don't actually need because you're rich. So. <laughs> I'll come to you in one second. Any other responses to where, where our friends should be looking for or why there's not more of this capital around? Well, I mean, maybe just what could we do better to, to increase sure. the flow? Um, you know, I, my observation is that impact investing is at a really early stage in its development, and the market uh, has not um, clarified and segmented yet. Uh, and uh, just the fact that we uh, are talking about impact first versus return first, um, I think is useful. So I think the sharper we can get about what we mean by impact investing and what some of the different segments are. I mean, my own view is that as, as it becomes clearer uh, that impact first is different than return first, that a growing number of uh, individuals, religious institutions, and certain foundations and, and development financial institutions will make an allocation, just like there's investment capital in philanthropy today. There could be there could be three. Mm -hmm. So I, so that would be it's just just recognizing that it's a an early stage um, in in its in its market evolution. Uh, I think we can do a better job on um, getting product to market. I mean, there's. I just don't think there's that much product out there that's genuinely impact first, and and every time more products come on, then there's more opportunities for it to for investors yeah. to engage. And then I think we need to be much clearer about what we mean by impact and better at measuring it, which is a, probably a, some a topic that we'll get into a little more here today. Yeah. Um, but I think it's unfair for um, a fund manager or anybody else to ask people to um, make the financial return sacrifice without being really clear about what they, what the intention is on the other side and over time what the, what the, the data is on the other side that, yeah. that suggests that these are, um, okay. these are effective. Yeah, go for it. So there's like, I want to respond to something Diane said, but I also, when you're talking about the expense of capital and like changing hearts and minds. I'm just like, the question I would have is like, well, whose hearts and minds are you trying to change? If it's the banks, like that's just not something that they're gonna sign up for. <laughs> it's really interesting if you look at like the big banks of the world um, in terms of like an Indian country, for example, they, a lot of the, um, 
investment that flows there, the grant capital comes from the foundation. It doesn't actually come from the bank. And because the banks are siloed, like the foundation will do like the really fun, makes you feel good stuff, but it doesn't actually change the culture of banking. So until the culture of banking can be influenced by that, I think it's going to be really, really hard um, for that expensive capital if that's where it's coming from to come down. And, uh, you know, I love... Um, I hate the term impact investing because I feel like once you use the term investing, it drives certain behaviors, and I don't know if those behaviors are good. Um, what I really enjoyed what Diane was saying is about you know, high net worth individuals dipping their toe in it, but I also think high net worth individuals have an obligation to go out there and tell their story about their money journey mm -hmm. and how they've gotten there so it doesn't seem as scary. I work, I'm very fortunate I work with one client in particular who is really wrestling with where her money came from or inheritors who are wrestling with the, where their money came from. And I think if more high net worth individuals to actually reconcile with how their money was made, they might have a very, very different approach into, into what they do with their money now. Yeah, can we? Oh, we, um, we don't. They somehow ran away with it. Yeah. Great. So um, specifically to Richard, and actually, um, if you can maybe talk a little bit about, too about 2X um, and how, how, how their women-focused initiatives rolling out. Sure. And I appreciate the question. I don't have the data to, to cite for you. A colleague of mine is at the conference, and I think he may be able to provide that. So if you see me afterwards. But we, I don't know if you've heard of the OPIC 2X initiative, which is our women's gender lens investing. We've, we've uh, I think, been fair to say, a leader among impact investors, among DFIs, in trying to, trying to uh, establish guidelines and, and criteria. If you look at the website uh, 2X Challenge, you'll see uh, what uh, a, a group of DFIs, led by OPIC and others, have come up with to establish the criteria for what could qualify as, as gender lens investing. And I'm not the one who who uh, designed that or led it, but uh, there, are, there are many aspects to it, women-led companies, how many women in, are employed, products and services that, that are delivered to women. And what we've been doing over the last year or so, uh, led by um, someone in our, in our organization named Katie Kaufman, some of you may have met, who's been a real incredible leader on this globally, is, is training ourselves and, and helping to train others. And, Getting, understanding how we need to uh, think about this and approach companies in discussions to help uh, move them in that direction. So it's not just about picking out the company like, oh, yeah, there's a women-led company, so that one is a good one for us to invest in as a gender lens strategy. But any company that could be doing things that would improve um, uh, women's uh, benefits from the project or women opportunities within, within that company. So we, uh, it, now we have all of our deal teams uh, coming to us with this is a 2x project, you know, <laughs> and sometimes actually we've had the opposite problem saying, well, well wait a minute, really let's examine carefully what qualifies that because we don't want to just put that 2x label on anything because then that would really dilute the meaning of it. So we've come up a learning curve and we're, we're really hopeful that that's going to move the needle. Yep. Um, yep. Question in the back. Right. Good question. Isn't there like half, half a trillion under management now? I don't know. If oh, well, he's there. saying from an impact first. Okay. He's saying from, yeah. Uh, Go. I don't, I mean, I don't think, I don't know that, and I don't know if anybody <laughs> knows that, but I, I, I want to, to the point of need, you kind of have, there's this huge need, and, and Rick might have a number, but I feel like you need to also realize, and I know you don't like the word investment, we could find some other word, but what is traditionally known as investment ready. So it's just because you're working with entities that the, the market, they're not, not going to have a market rate return, or they may not even have, we're just working for sustainability, or they may even be a big group ramp portion in there, if they're not ready for investment, either by a foundation or by, um, you know, impact first capital, 
it's there's it's going to be it's going to fail, and that's a big issue in all these markets because we really, which I think Rick was alluding to, yeah. you need to have investable products, and I think that the amount of money that's gonna have to flow that way is huge, and I feel like we haven't even started that discussion, mm -hmm. and we see a lot of that, because this is all we do, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Yeah, so I, Rick, do you want to take? Sure. Uh, in, our, in our case, um, we don't combine grant making with our impact investing. What we do is engage on a kind of targeted set of issues with the social enterprises that we're investing in. And those two issues tend to be around um, the, the quality and precision of their understanding of impact and how they can use various tools to clarify that and improve that over time. And the second is their investability. So our, uh, our debt team uh, is not only um, making the initial credit decisions, uh, but also often working with those partners to improve their own understandings of their balance sheet and their P&L and, and their growth plans and how that will make them more investable in the future. And so those are the two forms of kind of what might be described as technical assistance that we do. And, and I, but I see in the, in the space of wide variety, sometimes there are grants made, sometimes uh, there's specific to other types of specific technical assistance. That just happens to be ours. Great. One, one, one more, um, and then we'll, 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 oh. <laughs> um, I'd like to understand how impact versus investors think about risk adjusted returns, because risk adjusted is a pretty modest fee, and it's not like I'm happy to <laughs> tackle that. Well, I'll use global partnerships as an example, and I'll, I'll quickly use One Acre Fund as well, which we're invested in both. So um, global partnerships, as Rick alluded, have had multiple funds. Um, they've returned every single dollar on the funds that they've, com you know, um, so usually, you know, people worry, okay, they, they may not want to go into a fund that's first time fund. By the time, you're, you know, third time fund, they've got a great record. You know, I, I'm sleeping, I, I'm, I, I have no problems because I feel there's very little risk there. So I'm delighted to be able to, to um, invest in global partnerships. I feel the same way about One Acre Fund. So we would do that out of capital preservation as in our family assets because I feel that there's, that's pretty de-risked as well because they have a huge amount of debt that's required. They have a really, really low default rate with all their farmers and multiple countries. Um, again, I, I sleep easy. Um, other people, other foundations feel they have to do that out of their PRI budget. So that's how, how we perceive risk. We also are invested in funds where there may be real greater risk, and there's a huge use with a lot of development banks, so um, KFW, which is a German development bank, of, of first loss. So we're in a fund called the Blue Orchard Climate Change Fund. There's a huge first loss piece in there. I believe it's $50 million for a $150 million fund. You know what? I think that I am taking way less risk than some people are in developed market funds. Yeah. So I, you know, we just have a very different view on this. Oh. I would just add two quick things. Um, I think it's really different on the debt side than it is on the equity side for obvious reasons you know you can on the debt side you can see what's already been de-risked and what's proven and so on on the equity side with our social venture fund it's it's all about capital efficient de-risking of business plans so you know what are the major risks and how do you de-risk them in a capital efficient way so that your capital destruction uh, is is simply less uh, and so that, those are the kinds of disciplines that we try to use when we're going from seed to, to, to a round the other thing I would note is there's a lot of conversation about financial risk and risk adjusted financial returns there's a, a, a there's a directly analogous set of risks around impact and and what I would observe is that those um, require as much uh, thought and um, careful management as the financial ones we're, we're better collectively at the financial because we've been practiced at it longer but the impact risk is just as high and some of the moving up market versus going versus staying down market um, evolutions in product market strategy there are a whole host of those uh, so I I just would suggest that those are equally important things to consider right and just real quick chime in that we're 
that's where we start, risk-adjusted returns. We have been or managing as an organization for over 50 years to that. And, and as Rick said and others, that uh, we, will, we will be willing to, uh, to modify our approach from that depending on a specific tangible and measurable and reportable impact by people that have shown the track record and able to do that and deliver on that. Great. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap, wrap here um, just because of time, but um, I, I hope the panel gave everyone a good sense of how folks um, in this impact-first world are differentiating ourselves from others um, in, in the impact investment space. And um, I, I hope they don't ask you to attend some sort of re-education session about doing well by doing good on the way out. But um, if, if they do, just say you learned, oh, you do well, you do good, and they'll probably let you pass. <laughs> um, anyway, I want to thank all the panelists um, for, for coming out. And thank you for coming. <laughs>